Hey, good morning, Emmanuel. Welcome to church today. Good morning. Welcome. Oh, man. He's Was up. that live? I'm, yo, I'm so hyped right now. <laughs> Willie's ready to go. He's up in my energy. I, I got to bring it up. And we know it's like uh, that rainy Sunday yeah. morning feel, the one that you like, you want to sit back in bed, but we're at church this morning. Yes. So we are happy to be here. Hey, we want to know that you're here. And to do that, sign in. Sign hey, in. We just love to know that you're here, whether you're in the building, on our online campus, Go to the Church Center app right now, sign in, let us know you're here. If you're online or in person, who you're watching with, just let us know. Yes, please. We'd love to know. Do so, it now. If you don't I have, just did. Yeah, Willie, I actually still have it. Hands done. free, I did it. So, just with my mind. <laughs> I signed in. <laughs> so if you don't have the Church Center app, super easy. Download it, pick a manual church that is us, manual church of the Nazarene. And then it's just super easy. Every Sunday, it's a couple clicks and you're signed in. It's pretty great. And once you're signed in, uh, we want to make you aware of something really cool this fall. We mm -hmm. have 29 unique groups this fall, 29 different small groups. You can join and be part of any of them. Well, some of them are, are for specific people, like we got some young adult groups, yeah. some young couples groups, stuff like that. But if you're interested, there's a place on the website where you can learn more about these groups, where you can sign up to be a part of one of these groups. So if you go to the groups tab, either on our website or on the app, there's a list of all the groups that we're offering. Again, 29 20. different groups. That's a lot of different groups. Ooh. We have something for you if you wanna be online, if you wanna be in person. On the screen right now, you'll see how you can go onto the website and find this. So if you're thinking, man, I'm, I get lost on that website, just watch the screen right now. It'll tell, take you to the groups tab, tell you how to check out the groups. So um, at Emmanuel, we really consider groups as a vital part of connection that allow you to grow deeper in your faith, to get to know others in the church. So we really would love you to join a group this fall. It's really where you, know, you can grow in faith and in fellowship and community. Mm -hmm. It's a big part of, of what we do here. So go ahead, check that out on the website. And join a group this fall. Yes, definitely. And we got some other exciting news. It's that time of the year for Upward Registration is now open. So attention all parents and kids in first through sixth grade. Upward Sports is returning this year to Emmanuel Church. Registration is now open for your child to participate in Upward Basketball or cheerleading beginning in the new year. Registration will also close on November 6th when evaluations take place. And the practices will start the week of January 3rd with our first Upward Game Day is Saturday, January 15th. You can register and find more information at lansdale.church slash upward. So get at it. Yeah. Get those kids active. It's going to be great. Spread the word. Get registered. I'm going to be balling this year. <laughs> Willie's ready. <laughs> Willie's ready to go. Yes, yes. Also, starting point um, is beginning today. We had our 9 a.m. service, and this is gonna be a four-week group that's designed for anyone who's new or newer to the Emmanuel Church. It's a great place to learn about who we are as a church and how we can come alongside of you in your faith journey as you worship God, grow in faith, connect with others, and serve at Emmanuel in our community and around the world. Uh, this is also the first step to take if one day you'd like to finally become a member of the church so join in the groups tab on either the app or the website or just show up in room 130. It's not too late. It's not too late. If you weren't here during first service this week, talk to Ann. I'm sure she'd get you in. But that's a really great group oh, to yeah. get started here at Emmanuel. Hey, we have a really important video coming up for an incredible event. So you're going to listen to the details of this video. So why don't we go to the video? conversation that you can have face to face with someone that you care with. An intimate way that we get to talk to him and get to know him and allow him to get to know us on a deeper level. What is prayer to you? I don't know. A way you communicate to God. Join us on the night of prayer and worship, October 14th at 6.30 p.m. in Cafe Emmanuel Church. Let's gather together to bless our families, local churches, communities, and nations. Let's break our hearts and make us humble in His presence that may not be driven 
by our ego, but that we may understand God's will with simplicity and glorify His only Son, Jesus. That is going to be an awesome event to yes. be a part of. So you saw the dates up there. I'm really looking forward to those nights of prayer and worship. Hey, another event I'm looking forward to that is technically not for me, but I'm gonna weasel my way to show up anyway. The Fall Fam Jam is this Friday. If you don't know what a Fall Fam Jam is, let me explain. If you are in kids ministry, if you are a child who's in first through sixth grade, this event is for you. Basically, you get to come hang out on Friday, have all this fun, play games, win prizes, do all this super cool stuff. You're gonna get to hear a devotion. Yeah. I mean, that's awesome. It's all you need. And it's just gonna be tons of fun. So be here on Friday with Miss Allison. It's gonna be a great time, so much fun. If you have any questions, you can go to lansdale.church slash kids. There's more information on there. Or just find Miss Allison. She would love to tell you about it and how much fun that event is going to be. But there's only one way you're really going to know how much fun that event is. Oh, yeah. You got to be there. You got to be there. You got to so be there. be there this Friday here at Emmanuel at 5.30 p.m. It's almost time for service. I know we're like rearing and ready to go. I know I'm ready to go. Oh, I'm We got a great service for you guys today. God's going to be moving. But like always, I want to pray for our service. And just remind you, if you have a heart to give today, if, if you really want to give, there's a couple ways that you can do that. There's receptacles in the back and one in the lobby. You can go to the website or the app and just go to lansdale.church slash give. Um, there's multiple ways to give that way. We're still accepting uh, donations for the offering that Mark talked about last week for the missionary. Um, so if you're still interested in giving for that, that is still, it's still available for a couple weeks, I believe. But so you can give to that, you, you can give your tithe. If you're a guest with us here today, welcome. Um, we're asking that you not give. We want you to really receive from us before you feel like you have to give anything back. But if you're a regular attender who has a heart and feels called to give, then there's many opportunities to do that. But let me pray for us today for this service and for everything that God's gonna do. So. Let's pray. Father God, we are so thankful to be in your presence this morning. God, it, it just blesses my heart to look around and see a room full of people waiting to hear from you. God, and we have multiple ways that's gonna happen today. We're gonna worship, we're gonna hear your word, God. We're just gonna celebrate you today through this service. And so God, I pray this morning that we wouldn't let anything from this week hold us down, God, because we know that in your presence, chains fall and burdens are released, God. So I pray in this place today that through seeking you, we can just leave everything aside. We can grow closer to you today, God. We can come to know you in a new way, Father. We, we want you. We want who you are, because who you are is, is the greatest thing that we could ever experience. Yes, God, so I pray through this service today that you would move, that your spirit would just take a hold of this building and every person in it and every person watching. God, would you be so blatantly present that we can't deny your presence this morning? We love you and we thank you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, I'm ready. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right, let's go. Let's go. waking up this morning, and that's okay, but if you want to stand and worship with me, I would appreciate it. You can't go back to the beginning, you can't control what tomorrow will be, but I know
recognize that or not, whether in the moment we are living that out, you reign above it all. God, regardless of, of what the world says is most important, God, you reign above it all. That is why we have come to meet you this morning. So God, just take over in this moment. Allow us to lay everything else down. Allow us to lay it at your feet and just recognize that you are the most important. You are what has brought us here today. So God, allow us to let you love on us in the way that you so desperately want to. Allow us to just sit and listen with open hearts and open minds, God, for what you have to say to us. We love you. And we thank you. And all God's children said, Amen. Hello. I'm here to remind you that October is Pastor Appreciation Month. This year, we're going to recognize not only our three pastors, but also our directors of children's ministry and teen ministry. Allison Wetzel is our director of children's ministry. Allison is just uh, an amazing person with lots of energy, lots of creativity, who has a strong heart for our children. You're just amazing, Allison. We appreciate all that you bring and your family that are there and support you behind the scenes. Uh, your energy level is uh, just wonderful. Our director of teen ministry is Jake Bunjo. As many of you have experienced, Jake is a very engaging, fun, and yes, sometimes funny guy who <laughs> Uh, has a real heart for our teens. Uh, Jake is an excellent teacher, is uh, very engaging. You've done an amazing job, as well as Allison, of working through all the challenges that have been presented in the last year when we couldn't meet regularly as we normally would. Our pastor to Asian American families is Jungmo Ku. Jungmo, we love you and your family. Uh, you are a minister not only to Asian Americans who have the privilege of your primary attention, but Jung Mo, you speak to all of us and you minister to all of us, both when you lead us with singing in our worship times, but also individually as you reach out to us and as you've reached out to me and my family. We love you, we love your family, we're so grateful to have you as part of the team. Ann Hansen is our Connections Pastor. And Ann, we know your heart is in helping us to grow not only wider in our knowledge, but deeper in our relationship with, with God and Jesus Christ. And you've been such a blessing to us over the years, and your responsibilities go beyond just the small groups and some of those connections we love you and your family, and we're just so grateful to have you as part of our team. Our lead pastor is Mark Prue. Mark, you and Holly came here about 14 years ago, and what a blessing it has been since then. You're a tremendous leader. You're someone who is both knowledgeable and stays current and you and Holly are such a blessing to us. You bring a fresh word to us from God every day. And Mark is not just an influence here at Emmanuel. He's an important individual on the board of directors at Eastern Nazarene College. He's an instructor with Mizio Sem Seminary, teaching our next generation of leaders and ministers. He's active on the district uh, advisory board and other committees, and I'm sure there's many other things that I'm not even aware of or not even thinking of. But Mark and Holly, thank you so much for all you bring to us, and we love and appreciate you so much. So pastor appreciation isn't just about one day, one presentation, 
we want to reach out to each of these people and others on the church staff to let them know how much we love and appreciate all that they do and the wonderful individuals they are and perhaps more importantly even the wonderful team that they are. So let's take a few moments to show them our appreciation but also please reach out to them yourselves. Send cards. If you're so inclined, maybe a gift card or if you make blueberry muffins, maybe you want to make something for them. Uh, but just some tangible way to show your appreciation for all they do. So if you're one of the pastors or ministry leaders and you're here, please come forward. I know that Ann is leading uh, starting point, and Allison's running around with the kids. <laughs> Jake, I'm glad you made it. You, you made a cameo here because you have to get back to the teens. But as you can see, um, words, we can say a lot of words, but they're still not adequate for our feelings for you, our affection and our appreciation for you. And we just want to be intentional about telling you that today. And I would encourage all of you, as I said at the end of the video, please reach out to them in your own personal way and express your appreciation. So would you like to stand and thank them right now? Thank you. Thank you. you. may be seated. You know where this is going, directly to Holly. Just, you know. Um, from a um, church perspective, um, for Holly and I, Emmanuel has been the greatest blessing of our lives. Um, we are privileged to serve you, and we feel like you're our family. And we, we, we just have a warm feeling on the inside of us that you will always be with us in our hearts. And so on behalf of Holly and I and the rest of the staff, I just want to express my gratitude and my appreciation. So thank you. Hey, welcome to worship today, Emmanuel family. Online campus, welcome as well. I started last week a new series, which is going to be eight weeks called Better For It, Overcoming the Trauma of COVID. Where were you on October 12th, 2020? I had just had an appointment and finished up and got in the car and was driving to get my hair cut when someone from the church office called me and said, um, do you know what's going on? And I said, what, what are you referring to? And they said, you better put KYW radio on because Pennsylvania is about to shut down. And so sure enough, I mean, I listened and, um, you know, Governor Wolf was announcing that Pennsylvania is going to shut down tomorrow. And my first thought was, I don't even know what that means. My second thought was, do I need anything at Costco? So I called Holly, and I said, do we need anything at Costco? And she said, well, you know, we could use some toilet paper. <laughs> so I went to Costco after my haircut. Who would have thunk that it would be 12 weeks before I got another haircut? And I walked into, first of all, I drove into Costco parking lot, and it was crazy. And I walked into Costco, and the lines were all the way back to the end of the store, and there was nothing with regard to paper products on the shelves. And I just turned around and walked back out. 
I got in the car. I called Holly and said, we're in trouble. <laughs> one, one piece of toilet paper a piece, right? That began a series of crises over the next year, now 19 months, that nobody would have ever anticipated. The, the world essentially shut down. Um, the George Floyd murder brought to a tipping point already racial tensions within America and created great social unrest. Our economy immediately tanked. The stock market dropped. I remember our first pre-recorded online service. Because when we shut down, we all came back together as a staff and said, we're not sure what that means, but we're pretty sure we're not able to worship. So let's create a pre-recorded online service for Sunday. And so the only thing we could think of doing was to gather a few people back in the teen area. And they put a big camera in front of me. And Ann was over on the side, Pastor Ann, playing the piano and leading in worship. And back in those days, we decided we were going to serve communion every week and encourage people to receive communion in their home every week. We did that for months. But the first time we did that, we were sitting in these plastic little burgundy color chairs. And I opened up my communion element and I dropped the grape juice and it ran right down somewhere here. And then they turned to me and said, time for you to preach. And I went, <laughs> right? And I sat down on a bench, and honestly, the only thing I could think about while I was preaching straight into a camera for the first time ever was, can they see the grape juice that is spilled? And oh, it feels so uncomfortable to feel wet. I thought it was going to be four to six weeks. Did you? Holly and I, like many of you, had a glove routine in the beginning. Somehow, ShopRite still had gloves, you know, the surgical gloves, you know, medical gloves. And so we kept them in the car and kept them all over the place, actually. And we got into our first COVID argument, Holly and I, because we didn't get the protocol correct. We would go into the grocery store or Lowe's or Home Depot. We would be wearing our gloves. We'd pick up from the shelves whatever we were going to pick up, and we'd go back to the car. And I thought we were supposed to take our gloves off before we got into the car so that you could touch the steering wheel. Holly thought we were taking our gloves off when we got home. And so we had our first argument because I was like, well, what good is the steering wheel? You know, we touched everything on the steering wheel. Well, I thought you were, well, I thought you were, oh, let's get on the same page with this. Like most of you, when we brought our groceries home, we set them in the garage and we began to wipe them down and then we'd carry them in one by one. Crazy times. Interestingly, for some of you, COVID's actually been great. Nobody wants to talk about it because they feel guilty. Nobody wants to talk about it because they feel like it's going to minimize the suffering of many people. However, for some of you, you are now in the best job you've ever had in your life. And you're making more money than what you've ever made in your life. And guess what? Your work said, well, you can work remotely. And you were like, I don't know if I like that. I love that. And so for you, COVID has been a blessing and your life has never been better. But for many, many others, COVID has been a traumatic event. What is the definition of trauma? A traumatic, I can't use the same word in the definition, right? You know, my English teacher told me about that. An event that is disastrous, usually sudden. It's a crisis. 
Now, if COVID has been traumatizing for you, as it has been for most people, here is a central question that every Christian, a follower of Jesus, has to answer. You must answer it. Can I trust that God will be with me to get through this crisis? And can I trust that on the other side of this crisis, I will be better for it? That is not to say to minimize the suffering of others, and it's not to minimize your own suffering, but somewhere along the way, we need to embrace this idea that God can take bad and turn it into good so that eventually you'll become better for it. And that's what this entire series is about. Did you know that there are six responses to trauma? The first three everybody goes through. For Christians, the last three they have to choose. For example, the first response to drama is shock. This is the trauma that's caused when your world falls apart. You know that numb feeling? That feeling of disorientation where you're sitting there staring at the television for an hour or two and you don't really know what you're thinking about? It's the dazed feeling. Holly and I lost a child many years ago in childbirth. And Holly nearly died as a result of that. She just came literally within minutes of dying. And in the months after that, I remember we were living in Kansas City at the time. And I remember getting to work, but I don't remember driving to work. That's shock. Then there's sorrow. Sorrow is mourning the losses that you've experienced. And whether it's COVID or whether it's your own traumatic experience apart from the last 19 months, we have all experienced sorrow because we have lost something. That's the nature of trauma is we lose something in it. And then there's struggle. This is the struggle to try to get perspective on what has happened to us. Those are the first three, and everyone, whether you're a believer or not, everybody experiences those. But here's the next three, and these you're going to have to choose. Surrender. This becomes the pathway to God's peace. Sanctification. This is how God uses your trauma to shape your heart and your character. And then finally, the culmination of it is service. This is how God uses you to help other people. Now today is about talking about the first response to trauma, which is shock. And the question is, has your world ever fallen apart? Okay, just forget for a moment about the last 19 months. Has your world ever fallen apart apart from that? A divorce? Spouse that's gone back to drinking? Job loss, loss of a child, loss of a dream. Here's the thing. If you have not experienced trauma and your world has not fallen apart, I have to say, yet. Because it is the nature of life that life hits you hard and you will experience your world falling apart at one point or another. That is not good news. That is not bad news. That is, that is reality news. But here's the thing. God has promised us in the middle of our world falling apart that he will help us, strengthen us, and we will be better for it. And that's what today is about with regard to shock. If there was ever a man whose world fell apart, it was Job. So I'm going to ask you to stand. Go in God's word to Job chapter 1. We're looking at verses 13 through 22. I'll be reading out of the New Living Translation. Job chapter 1. I'll start reading in verse 13. Think about these verses in terms of his world falling apart and the shock of that. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting at the oldest brother's house, a messenger arrived at Job's house with this news. Your oxen were plowing with the donkeys feeding beside them when the Sabaeans raided us. They stole all the animals and killed all the farmhands. 
I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. The fire of God has fallen from heaven and burned up your sheep and all the shepherds, and I am the only one who escaped to tell you. That's a poetic way of saying there was a massive lightning storm. While he was still speaking, a third messenger arrived with this news. Three bands of Chaldean raiders had stolen your camels and killed your servants. I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger arrived with this news. Your sons and daughters were feasting in their eldest brother's home. Suddenly a powerful windstorm, probably the same storm of the lightning storm, but this one was a tornado. You ever seen a storm in the Midwest where there's great lightning and tornado at the same time? It swept in from the wilderness and hit the house on all sides. The house collapsed and all your children are dead. I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. Job stood up, tore his robe in grief. Then he shaved his head and fell to the ground to worship he said I came naked from my mother's womb and I will be naked when I leave the Lord gave me what I had and the Lord has taken it away praise the name of the Lord in all of this Job did not sin by blaming God wow heavenly father Through your spirit, would you speak words of comfort and clarity to us this moment about our moment when our world falls apart? What do we do when that happens? And we want to be better for it on the other side. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So probably within 30 minutes, Job's world fell apart. And sometimes we forget Mrs. Job, but Mrs. Job's world fell apart just as much as Mr. Job. His sons and daughters were killed by a tornado. A lightning storm struck and killed 7,000 sheep and all their shepherds. A raiders from the north and from the south, the Sabaeans and the Chaldeans, stole the rest of his livestock and killed the farmhands. Job was afflicted. We'll see this in chapter 2. He was afflicted with boils from head to toe. Now the question this morning that we need to ask and answer is simply this. What did Job do when his world fell apart? And more importantly, what do you do? And what do I do? How do we handle this? What's the biblical response? What's the Christian response? When life smacks us hard, when your spouse dies, and after the funeral, you go home, and you just walk through an empty house, what do you do? I see four things that Job did, and I offer them to you as a way to give comfort and encouragement and perseverance. Number one, feel your feelings. Job stood up, he tore his robe in grief, then he shaved his head. What is that about? Well, back in ancient days, when you tore your clothes, that was a sign of grief and sorrow and humiliation. You were brought low. Same thing with the shaving of the head. There is a long history in the Old Testament and the New Testament of people tearing their robes. Reuben tore his robes when he went back to the cistern and discovered that Joseph's brothers had lifted him out of the cistern and sold him into slavery in Egypt. The Bible says that Reuben was beside himself and he ripped his clothes. David, before he was king, tore his robes when he got the news that Saul and his best friend Jonathan had been killed in battle. Elisha tore his robes when Elijah was taken up into heaven. Mordecai, remember the book of Esther? Mordecai tore his robes when he discovered that wicked Haman had a plot to exterminate the Jews. 
wicked King Ahab tore his robes when Elisha condemned him and prophesied about his end and judgment. And unbelievably, in the New Testament, Paul and Barnabas, they tear their robes when they're in a little town called Lystra in central Turkey. And they, they do all these miracles and they preach the gospel in such a way that the people of Lystra thought that they were gods themselves and began to worship them. And Paul and Barnabas tore their robes in lament and grief and saying, do not worship us, we're but men. When life hits you hard, you tear your robes. And you shave your head because that's what you do. You feel your feelings. Since God gave you your feelings, you might as well use them. Everything that you and I have felt the last two years is normal. So let's just put it under that umbrella. If you've been feeling anxious, that's normal. If you've been feeling depressed, that's normal. If you've been feeling skeptical, that's normal. If you've been feeling angry, that's normal. If you do not know what you're feeling, that's normal. The only thing you should not do is to use your feelings to hurt other people. Sometimes when we are angry, frustrated, depressed, we act out and we hurt the people around us. That's just a no-no, right? We shouldn't be doing that. And that's why in verse 22 it says, in all of this, Job didn't sin by blaming God. Job plumbed the depth of his grief. I'm going to talk about this next week, so I'm going to leave most of it for next week. But what you repress and suppress will come back to you. And they will get the better of you. You must get it out. Number two, make self-care a priority. When your world falls apart, make self-care a priority. Job 2, 8, he scraped his skin with a piece of broken pottery. What on earth is that about? Is it that Job is so afflicted by these boils and he's in such misery that he just sits there in his ashes and continues to mourn and all he has to do all day is to just take a piece of broken pottery and scrape himself with these boils all over him? Actually, Job was treating himself with the highest tech medical care he could at the time. Some years ago, I got an infection. I have no idea to this day how I got it, but, but I got an infection on this finger. And within four hours, my hand was blown up. And it was a Wednesday night at church, and people were walking around going, man, that looks terrible. And I said, I know, I'm not really sure what to do. I'm just going to go home and, you know, try to put a hot compress on it. And somebody said, you should not go home. You should go to the hospital. No, I'm not going to go to the hospital for that, right? Well, guess what? I went home and Holly said, you're going to the hospital. <laughs> so I went to the hospital and I'm in the ER and they're looking at it and they automatically put me on um, antibiotics and they said, you'd be dead by morning. Because this infection would travel up to your heart, you'd be gone. And I said, thank you for a wife that made me go to the hospital. Unbelievably, I spent the next four days in the hospital. And then the doctor did something that gave me immediate release of my pain. He got out this scalpel and went, and let it all drain out. And over the next week, my hand, as puffy as what it was, went down and back into normal. You know what Job was doing? Job was sitting there and he took a broken piece of pottery that was super sharp. He had boils from head to toe. Think MRSA. And he was simply trying to lance all the boils and let them drain and clean them out. And then he put oil on them. Because back in the Old Testament, even in the New Testament, oil was always a healing sign. That's why we anoint people with oil today. It's, the, it's a symbol of the Holy Spirit, but it's also a symbol of healing. You know, there's 12 kinds of oil in the Old Testament. Job probably put on his boils cedarwood oil, which was known to treat leprosy at the time. 
Now, here's the thing. When you and I are going through a really rough patch, we tend to think that self-care drops off the map. We tend to think like, I'm so, I'm so in mourning, I'm so worked up, I don't have time to go to the gym. So we go to Yum Yum and get some, a dozen donuts. That's what we do, right? I don't care about my physical activity. At the very moment in which we don't care is the time where we should care the most. When you are totally, when your world falls apart, you should go to the gym. It's self-care. I went to the doctor last month for my yearly physical, which I didn't have in two years. I was a little worried. He said, Mark, there's good news and bad news. I said, I'm always up for the bad news first because I want to end on a high note. And he goes, well, the bad news is you, you really should lose some weight. What's the good news? You're the same weight as what you were pre-COVID. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm not where I should be, but I could be a whole lot worse. Sometimes you just take the win. So I'm not casting blame on anyone. I just grew up thinking that taking care of your body was somehow not spiritual. I just was kind of dualistic in my thinking. You know what I'm saying? Good Christians do all these things, but all these things never included taking care of yourself. I've come to realize that that's not true at all because holiness is wholeness. So what's good self-care? If you want to be safe, sanctified, filled with the Holy Spirit... You should eat healthy, get enough sleep, exercise regularly, practice good hygiene, take a shower every day, brush your teeth every day, shave, get out of your pajamas all day long and get some clothes on, do something you enjoy every day like working in the garden, painting or reading, find ways to relax like yoga, getting a massage, taking a bath, walking in the woods, do whatever you have to do to bring yourself back into balance when you're in the middle of a crisis. Don't wait until after the crisis. Do it in the middle of the crisis. That's what Job did. You know why Job is scraping himself? Because there's something inside of Job that says, I'm going to get through this. And i got to make sure I'm going to be good on the other side. Number three, let others in. Let others help you. When three of Job's friends heard of the tragedy that he had suffered, verse 11 says of chapter 2, they got together and traveled from their homes to comfort and console him. Many of you know the name of Rick Warren, founding pastor of Saddleback Church. He wrote the best-selling book, Purpose Driven Life. He and Kay are truly authentic people. Holly ran into Kay at a conference at Saddleback Church a number of years ago and just had an opportunity to chat with her a little bit. Genuine as genuine can be. Most people don't know that the Warrens had a son who struggled with mental illness his entire life. And several years ago, in a low moment, he committed suicide. Now here he is, Rick and Kay Warren, America's pastor. That's his title. And they found their son. They were devastated. Within a few minutes, their small group that they had been a part of for 13 years showed up at their door. They refused to let them go in to Matthew's home alone. And that small group took care of them month after month after month. The Warrens discovered some interesting things about their neighbors. Their neighbors just started doing things for them out of the blue. One neighbor came over and just took out their trash to the side of the road so they wouldn't have to do it. Another neighbor 
Warrens look out their window one day, another neighbor's just washing their car. After a few months of being away, just mourning and grieving, it was time for Rick to go back to preach again. And they have Saturday night services, and so he was getting ready to go to the Saturday night service to preach for the very first time since Matthew had died. And his Muslim neighbor, his Muslim neighbor named Yasser, came over and said these words, I do not want you driving to church, Rick. I'll drive you. I'm not going to let anybody else. I'm your neighbor. Remember, love your neighbor as yourself. And so Yasser gets in the car and drives Rick to worship. Let others in. I am an ambivert. You know what that means? There's extroverts, there's introverts, and the middle is ambiverts. I'm a situational introvert or a situational extrovert, you know, depending on the situation. When I'm hurting, everything within me wants to pull in. Everything. I can come up with scripture to support that. I can come up with the best rationale to support why I'm being pulled in. But actually, it's the worst thing I can do. Because when your world falls apart, you need to let other people in. So Job had these three friends. And they just, as soon as they found out what had happened to Job, they just go knocking on his door. And Job could have done what Americans typically do. He could have opened up the door and said, oh, hey, thank you so much. I'll take the casserole. You know, it's really a difficult time for us right now. Thank you so much. Can you call back later and close the door? But Job didn't. He opened up the door and let these three guys in. Now, here's the crazy thing. His three friends ended up being horrible comforters. I mean, have you ever had somebody like try to comfort you, but everything they said that came out of their mouth was the wrong thing? And you're like, this is not helpful at all. God just needed another angel in heaven. That's why he took your boy. Come on. That's profoundly hurtful. What I find interesting about the entire book of Job is that Job never told his friends to leave. I mean, if my friends would have said some of the things that Job's friends said to me, I'd be like, yeah, gotta go. But Job kept the ongoing conversation even though they were doing a really bad job of comforting them. You know why? Because Job figured something's better than nothing. And I need to have people around me. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, what's he doing? He's, he's basically laying down his life before the Father, saying, not my will, but yours be done. And Jesus says, Peter, James, and John, come, stay, come, come close to me. I need you. When your world falls apart at the very moment in which you want to be alone is the very moment when you should let people in. Because we're built for community. And we need other people. Lastly, Job made worship a priority. And he cried out to the Lord for help. I find it amazing, this phrase, and he fell to the ground to worship. Do you know that God has put an inner compass inside of us that when we go through tragedy, we immediately want to run back to him? If you doubt that, if you were alive when 9-11 happened, you'll discover that for months after 9-11, churches were full. Right after 9-11, on a Wednesday night, I held a prayer meeting out in the front of the church that I was pastoring at the time, and so many people showed up, and we stood around in a circle, and we just prayed. We prayed for each other. We prayed for our country. We just prayed, and we sought God, and we worshiped him. One of the most compelling stories in the Old Testament is the story of David and Bathsheba. 
You know that story well. David was walking around his palace one day, and in those days, the palace was the highest ground. And so you often wonder, how could David have been looking down on Bathsheba as she was bathing herself on the rooftop? It's because the king's palace was always the highest, and the king was looking down over his entire city, and he could see everybody on their rooftops. But Bathsheba caught his eye. And the Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 12 that he called for her and she came and they slept together. And within a short period of time, she responded back and said, I'm pregnant. So David concocts this plan that he's going to call her husband, Uriah the Hittite, back. And he's going to, you know, the fake news, you know. Um, so, um, you know, how's it going with the war, Uriah? And oh, by the way, why don't you go home and spend the night with Bathsheba and nobody will be the wiser. Everybody will think he's the father. But Uriah was more righteous than King David and said, far be it from me to enjoy things, the intimacy with my wife that other soldiers, my brothers, cannot enjoy. So he slept outside his own home. And David's like, oh. Right? He gets Uriah drunk again for the second time and tries to get him to go home and sleep with Bathsheba, but he's more righteous than David even if he's drunk and he won't do it. And so David hatches this plan to murder Uriah. So now there's an adulterous relationship, now there's murder, and that's exactly what happens, right? The troops would draw back and they leave Uriah on the front lines and Uriah gets killed and David goes, whoo, all right, Bathsheba, come on, I'm gonna marry you. And nobody's the wiser until Nathan the prophet calls him out on it and says, you're the man, you've sinned. A son was born to David and Bathsheba. And part of God's judgment, God said, that son's not gonna live. And the son got very sick. And David, for seven days, would not get up off of the ground he prayed, begged God for mercy. He, he, he cried out to the Lord. He fasted. He would not have anything to eat. And David's advisors were worried because he was grieving so much. And then one day, the seventh day, David looks over and he sees his advisors whispering in the corner. And he goes, what's wrong? The advisors didn't want to tell him that his boy had died because they thought, man, if he's grieving like this, what's going to happen when his son dies? And David put two and two together and said, the boy's dead, isn't he? That's right, he is. You know what verse 20 says of chapter 12? Then David got up from the ground after he had washed, put on some lotions, changed his clothes. He went to the house of the Lord and worshiped. Why did he do that? He did it for the same reason that Job did. When Job's world fell apart, he worshiped. It's just like Peter, what he said to Jesus, to whom else shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Worship heals. Worship cleanses. Worship gives perspective. You know, we say that Job lost everything that day, but he didn't. Job still had his life. Job still had his wife. Job still had his friends, and Job still had God. And those four helped Job put his life back together again. Instead of thinking, God, why did this happen? Why did you allow this to happen? Sometimes we ought to flip it and say, what's left? that I can rejoice over. I have seen this over and over and over again through the years. Somebody loses a child and they spend the rest of their life grieving that child and they forget about the children they still have. They forget about the spouse they still have. They forget about the church, the God that they still have because they're so focused on this, they become myopic. Worship restores perspective. Worship heals you. 
Worship is lancing the boil of your world falling apart and allowing God to clean it out and say, come on, you'll be better for it on the other side. So I'm just wondering, if you've really, really been worshiping these last couple years, that's what we're going to do in just a moment. Worship team is going to give a, a beautiful closing song. And my invitation to you is this. Maybe for the first time in two years, I don't know. It's just between you and God. But maybe you should just open up your heart in a way to God and expose your own woundedness, expose your own brokenness, expose your own anxiety and fears and depression, your own anger. And you just go, God, here I am and allow God to cleanse you, allow God to restore your perspective. Maybe for some of you, during worship, you should step out into the aisle. And stepping out into the aisle is your way of saying, I'm gonna trust God in the middle of my world falling apart. And I believe that when this is all over, I'm gonna be better for it. Because that's what God's promised. And I'm just gonna take that as a word of faith today. Would you stand please? Holy Spirit, these next few moments are all about you. Would you give us a cleansing, renewed perspective on how big you are, even in the midst of our own struggles, Help us to truly worship you these next few moments. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let's bow our heads together. I want to pray a blessing over each of you, particularly those that um, are experiencing a lot of sorrow because their world has fallen apart. Father, you are so good, you are so gracious. You're kind, you're loving, you're slow to anger, you're rich in mercy, you're abounding in love. And sometimes life hits us really hard. But you're right there, helping us pick up the pieces. So God, today I pray for brothers and sisters that have experienced some level of pain in these last 19 months. I'd ask God that you would put the oil of the Holy Spirit on their woundedness and that you would soothe, salve, and heal and make them better for it. Lord, we cannot control what happens to us many times, but we can control our response to it. And we want our response to be falling at your feet in worship, magnifying your name, blessing you because you are a good and a gracious God, thanking you for what we do have in spite of our losses. And you will see us through. We give you praise today. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go. Have a great rest of the week.